The idea is to provide a net performance computing solution to the problem of delivery routes to the current aviation system in a smart city area. And they come out with a solution which is, let's say, pretty interesting from an application point of view because it uses what is called approximate computing, which, let's say, poses also some challenge in how to model this type of approximate computing from a standard simple QE network perspective. So the idea is that we have some clients that uh, ask from a route in, in going from one point to another point in the city and there is this single high performance computing solution that uh, try to propose to the people routes in a coordinated way so that uh, people mm, doesn't all be uh, aren't all being routed along the shortest path uh, by they try to share different paths along the city to respect policies and um, create a global path in, in the city. Well, basically this uh, application uh, works in three different levels. So, first the uh, user selects uh, where he is starting and where he wants to go and then what the first stage of the algorithm does is trying to compute several alternative routes of different land passing from different parts of the city so to explore a lot of different areas. Then from the, uh, each of these different routes uh, starting from some data about the traffic and the condition of the city, what the system does is computing the uh, completion distribution. So, which is the probability distribution that one car starting from point A going to point B along this route will take to arrive at its destination. And the final stage, uh, from all these alternatives that have been proposed, tries to uh, sort them according not only to the average traveling time or the percentile of traveling time but also to other policy coming from the uh, municipality so like uh, discourage uh, passing from the city center or avoid climate road work or having locations or whatever so to be able to find routes that might be actually faster or even if they are fastest they will not create too many problems in the city and so finally the best route is sent back to the current navigation system that will then lead the car from its starting point to its destination. Okay, um, this system is composed of three parts, while the last two parts are easy from a performance evaluation point of view because they can simply be modeled by the MMCQ or by the MMCQ which is driven by some sort of fork and join process because of the rules uh, in the one that computes the um, distribution in the second model can be um, studied by different servers so that we can compute the uh, time uh, traveling time distribution by different Okay. What is instead really interesting is the first part that generates the actual topology uh, routes that the car might follow. And this is where the approximate computing solution is being applied. In particular, this component has several different ways in which it can be It's just one server, but it works in a very different way. So, first of all, it has two different types of operating. One, when there is a normal traffic, a normal workload in a routine request, and another whenever we have a peak of request. For example, it is the peak hour or there is some event where everybody is trying to go. So, if we are in peak, there is some sort of fast algorithm. This is why this is called approximate computing. Of course, the fast algorithm is much faster than the other. But it is faster because it provides an approximate solution. It doesn't take into account all the possible things that one routing algorithm can take, and maybe it goes just by 
some tax or something very similar that goes with the, from the shortest path to from the suit to destination without doing any for Instead, the standard execution algorithm is something much more complex that accounts for um, several possible alternative paths, tries to solve them, and uh, returns a set of paths to the uh, second part of the algorithm that will, that will then compute the time distribution. Of course, creating all these alternative paths is something that takes time. And so there is a second point that uh, creates the amount. So if uh, at a given point in time there aren't uh, uh, a given threshold that has been passed, then the execution control will stop and instead of continuing to give other alternatives, we just stop with the alternative that has been provided up to that point. Okay, so if uh, the system is fast, it will provide a 10 alternative, otherwise if it takes in too long and after one second on the 6 out of 10 possible alternatives being generated, the system will stop and the best solution will be chosen among 6 and not among 10. Okay, and again this is some sort of approximation, approximate computing in the sense that we can tailor the quality of the result to meet some performance objective. Okay, so uh, even if this is the model, I will make a focus just on this part that uh, is producing the alternative loop because it's the one that couldn't be analyzed with conventional technique and for which we try to create a more sufficient in particular, in order to be able to describe this in the best way, we use uh, a hybrid model, high level modeling language where we use some queuing network and queuing primitives like um, fork and join, between three station, and some other primitives took from the petrinets just to have uh, the possibility of understanding condition and choose different things. And in this case, basically, where we have some regular uh, traffic condition, we have that some request arrives, uh, they are being served, when they are served, they produce 10 possible alternative routes. Here we have one fourth, meaning that the routes are produced in parallel. Uh, we use some special type of joining that uh, this is not a natural joining that will um, uh, compose the job when all the part here and all the part are finished, but this is some joint that uh, as long as it, it has as many, uh, it takes just the first arrival either from the regular or the timeout, so that uh, if too much time is taken, all the time out we have arrived first and we close the joint and the other will be discovered. Uh, if there is some time out, then the um, computation that goes from the uh, bottom part will reach the joint and will end this type of the job. And here the uh, overload is uh, detected by the threshold of the queue when there are n jobs, uh, when the queue reaches a given threshold then, then these jobs are served with the fast version of the algorithm that uh, will um, provide the fast solution. And it is very, uh, okay, this has been solved using the Java modeling tool, which has been supported mainly by uh, Professor Sarazzi of Polytechnic of Milan, which is now an emeritus, and um, he is, let's say, my boss over there, and uh, Giuliano Casale from the Imperial yeah. College in, in Malta. And this new version of GMT supports uh, both the possibility of including Petrinet uh, primitives in Q network, and also this French type of fork and join where some of the jobs in the join might be discarded to reach some given goal. Okay, the interesting thing of this approximate computing behavior is that we have a non-monotonical behavior in the performance. For example, this feature over here shows how the response time changes with the workload. Uh, we see that the response time tends to increase, but then it drops. And why it drops? Because while the system becomes overloaded, the fast solution gets used more and more and more often. So the quality decreases, 
the red line, see how much the fast solution is being applied. The quality increase, but this decrease in quality, increases the speed, and so we have actually a um, reduction in the response time. Of course, at the one point in which also the fast algorithm became too slow to be able to handle the system and everything, of course. Okay? Um, uh, we have uh, parameterized this model with data coming from the um, urban area in Milano. We have uh, implemented a version of the software and we have um, fit with some traces and we have been able to parameterize and match and see that this particular model is actually able to uh, handle the system with uh, reasonably good results. Okay, so once we had this, we were able to model this application and in particular here the problem was to study how many cores should be given to the, um, each part of the application. So how many cores give to the proximate computing part, how many to the one that can the distribution and how many to the one that provides the final solution. And uh, well, with some search problem, uh, starting from data coming from the actual workload, which changes during the day, so there are some other which we have more requests, some other language we have less. Uh, we have been able to find which is the minimum number of core required to have a utilization of less than 70% in the search. And so we were able to determine for each of the three stages how many cores will be required which, uh, to support the application with the given performance goal in the different time zone, uh, sorry, in the different time period of the day. Okay? And with this, uh, if one provider which wants to apply this uh, type of algorithm, uh, instead of uh, always buying the maximum number of cores, which is around 700, tries to open, shut down and start up the virtual machine during the days, it can allow to save almost 50% uh, of the cost and of uh, the, the energy. And of course, that was the reason for going in this capacity way. Okay, so basically that's it. The main focus was that uh, this uh, approximate computing scenario is something that uh, is uh, interesting from a modeling point of view and here it was solved at a high level using a Q-network stochastic pattern. Actually, since we have the tool, this was, let's say, a motivating example for the tool, so we didn't invest too much time in trying to find an analytical solution, which I guess might uh, be, I don't think uh, we might find an exact identical analytical solution, but something might also be done from an analytical point of view. Um, here, if we have this type of tool, it was interesting to see that uh, mixing languages like Petronet and the Q network is what allowed us to uh, put in a classical Q network program. Uh, in another language to describe a feature that the Q network alone would have not been able to include, or in order to include, would have required us to modify the system. And this is interesting because here it was applied to this routing algorithm, but uh, we have a similar system, not exactly like this, but very close to this one, in uh, the case from the edge computing and fault computing that are basically the same behavior. And so my benefit from being able to describe the primitives with different languages. With this, I conclude my day quick introduction. Yes, uh, yes, please, sir. The first question. I was here part of this calculation of this creation of network or some of this. Yes, Java And then the calculations of numbers of cores is not also in Java? Uh, no, okay, the Java model you do is just a, a general purpose to you in network simulator, which also has some Petrinet feature. 
and the model were run with this tool. So uh, there was uh, a search procedure which uh, um, repeated the model several times with different parameters searching for the best uh, options. So when you say that the run was, let's say, 400 cost, that was a maximum power of yeah, exactly. Or a key card between grams separately. Exactly. The main idea was that uh, each of these parts where we could define the number of executors in parallel for the portion of the algorithm uh, were able to. Because uh, in any case, in this particular type, the reason for which a single HVC solution is interesting is the core we want, is because we want to have the routing inside the boot city. So if there is one, let's say, single point, uh, knows how many cards has been sent on route A, so I will send on route B other cards because I know they are already sent on route A this many. Okay, this is the reason for having a single point of service. Nonetheless, each of the routes can be worked individually. And so, of this workload, which in the Milan area is in estimated to be around 2 million of requests per day, can be massively parallelized due to the fact that they are all identical. Uh, I have a similar question about the analysis method. Uh, I have a similar approach which I will present tomorrow. <coughs> No, okay. Uh, actually, it wasn't approximated because it was a um, uh, discriminant simulation. So, uh, 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 there could be, I mean, we have worked on exact solution, but not on these particular problems. Okay. okay. Yeah. Excuse me, just to continue. Uh, this, uh, this is question that networks. This is a, a certain language to, to describe it from. But then to, to have numerical results, you should translate it either to simulation, either to market event. And in your case, we use discrete event simulation. State event simulation. Thank you. So, of course, this is a very important problem. But the solution here looks at only on one aspect. And then, uh, calling on mine, uh, work on Chicago and he gave two different criteria. One was the time, the other was greener. How green is the route? Because you know you, you know the traffic, so you know how efficient the car would be driving this way. And some drivers may choose green route when it's slightly longer if they have spare time. So it would be very nice extension to include these two solutions and give the choice to the driver. Okay. Uh... As far as I know, the driver wasn't asked, please uh, give me the greener solution, please give me the faster solution. But uh, in uh, deciding this uh, road graph network when presenting different alternatives to the different stage of the algorithm uh, was uh, created to potentially support also uh, this type of uh, criteria. But uh, as far as I know, it wasn't intended to give the possibility to the user to tune its patterns, okay? Um, but of course, this is something that uh, could be very interesting, at least from the application point of view. And especially important to the cities, I think that the models of the road network are very In my opinion, it should be also important to do something that needs to have some sort of multimodal transportation. So uh, yes. don't go there by the car. Go to the parking lot and get the mail. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. There's no more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much the organizer for inviting me here. Uh, <coughs> uh, this talk is a little different than previous talks. It's
related to, um, let's say, soft computing techniques. Uh, we talk. Together recent perhaps uh, ten years, uh, uh, the girl and uh, the left us after a few years. So later I continue with Piotr uh, Duda and uh, Maciej uh, Jaworski. Uh, you know, University Częstochowa between Warsaw and Prague. Uh, the content of, of, of our lecture is here because of time. I will go rather fast and concentrate on some, some important issues. Uh, the, the lecture is based on our recent book, it is uh, Spring in 2019, uh, actually it is 2020. If you look at, you know, Springer advertisement, it is 2020. Uh, stream data mining, hundreds and data analytic properties, it is the title, exactly the same as the title of this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, of course, it's not possible to uh, uh, overview all uh, all material uh, of this book during 30 minutes. Uh, the last time I look at the schedule uh, of, uh, of this uh, seminar, it was maybe, maybe a week ago or two weeks ago, and uh, I had at the time one hour. So I was not aware that uh, so it will be, uh, uh, let's say, 25 minutes. So no, no problem for no problem for me. Just you know, I concentrate on some some most important issues uh, of uh, stream data uh, mining. Uh, so it is related to big data, and uh, all of you uh, know what is big data and what are the characteristics as you see uh, here. And uh, stream data, uh, it's, it's like say part of the big data. Order data is constantly generated, continuously generated by different sources. Uh, there are some special characteristics I'll uh, tell you in a moment about uh, stream, uh, stream data uh, uh, characteristic. Uh, one perhaps the most important is concept drift. Uh, it means that the uh, properties of stream may change over over time and. Uh, because of that, there are uh, some difficulties, in, you know, uh, trying to trying to develop algorithms uh, for for uh, streaming uh, data. Uh, typical problems in data mining uh, are the same uh, for small data and big data. Uh, I mean, uh, traditional traditional data and streaming data. So there are two problems: regression and classification so all of us know what is regression problem as you see here in case of uh, of in case of uh, streaming data that 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 curve that we supposed to estimate it's possible uh, some some changes so we should track changes of that of the uh, black black uh, uh, indicated here uh, curve, uh, so it, it is much more difficult than in the case of traditional uh, regression uh, uh, problems. Uh, similar uh, in the case of uh, classification, this is a traditional two-dimensional classification problem. In case of streaming data, the black curve, you know, it may change, it may change during time. So uh, we should we should construct algorithms. Uh, Tracking those changes, and it it it, it is a, a you know it's a real challenge. It's not 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 easy to. It's not not possible to directly adapt. You know, I mean, modify. We have some tools for traditional data. It's not it's it it, 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 it would not work if you try to you know to to make some changes, small changes of traditional data mining algorithms. It will not work. Uh, for some characteristic of stream data, huge volumes of uh, data, uh, 
multi-dimensional feature is often fast change. Change. Uh, and this is the, the difference are emphasized here. Perhaps the one of the most important is stream of data. One pass of data in case of stream data. And in case of static data, all data are available at any time. Of course, in the case of stream data, uh, of course, in the case of stream, it's possible that the distribution uh, change with, with, with time. And, and another difference is in case of static data, it's unlimited processing time. In case of stream data, I think time depends on rate of, uh, of uh, incoming data. The pointer? Is it works or not? So, uh, this a terminology, uh, maybe I'm not familiar with the terminology, uh, which is uh, it's called concept drift. It's phenomenon describing the change in data distribution. Uh, so, uh, in, in the literature, uh, uh, you, you see that uh, you know, the data, uh, you know, the um, random variables, uh, they come from different uh, probability densities, like you see. In, 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 in literature, there are different, there are different uh, uh, concept drifts and they are suddenly implemented, gradual, recurring, uh, irregular, and so on. Uh, how to deal with concept drift? One, 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 one manner is slightly quicker, so we, we, we should uh, eliminate exams come, coming from an old concept. And uh, the, the problem, the problem How to, you know, what, 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 what how many elements, you know, should fill in this, in this uh, window? Uh, I mean, uh, how to find it, uh, in, in a sense, optimal sense. So maybe uh, uh, Professor Chakulski uh, knows that uh, a, a person who uh, made a clever and original idea uh, who was uh, the first director of your institute, Professor Stefan Wengzu, uh, in his book, I think in the 50s or 60s. Uh, today nobody uh, is uh, aware of it. That Professor Stefan Wengzu presented perhaps the first in the world, you know, theoretical solution. So, how to design that window? How, how many elements should, should, uh, should be taken? In, in the window. I mean, to eliminate all data and how many, you know, to take, how many to take in, uh, in, uh, in the window. And, and, that, and that research was uh, later on uh, uh, was uh, continued by uh, Professor uh, Stanisław Kozielski. And uh, it was his PhD. And I remember I participated in seminar in the 70s. Today, perhaps nobody knows about that. I, I remember it's a very interesting result, theoretical result. Uh, so, uh, in the literature, uh, there are some there are some attempts to you know to uh, to design sliding windows. Uh, the most natural uh, 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 approach is is based on weighted windows. So all these examples are discarded by using a decay function. So it, 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 it works in the, you know, perhaps in the literature from automatic control maybe 50 years or 60 years ago that was such, such a problem was presented. Also in the context of the uh, sequential recurrent least force uh, algorithm. Uh, there are some other uh, okay. There are some other concepts uh, how to uh, how to design the window. Uh, I will not uh, present details because of time. Uh, researchers in this area uh, apply traditional, well-known statistical tools. So they take part of data and uh, compare with another part of data. And they check if you know if uh, uh, means of two populations, like you see, are the same or not. Or another approach: take you know estimate distribution. 
have checked the difference between one distribution of one part of data and distribution of another part of data. And in this case, they use Kolmogorov, Smirnov uh, test, and you know, very you know, commonly used uh, method. Not, nothing sophisticated here. Uh, there are some references. You see uh, how to process in data. There are two methods. One is online processing. I mean, instant incremental. So we the model is updated after reading every single data element. This is one approach. And another approach is based on uh, the so-called chunks. You see how it works. Uh, it is self-explained here. So updating, but updating of the model must be completed before the next chunk of data is. Uh, collected uh, concerning concerning design properties of a uh, uh, system for dealing with data stream. Uh, so as you see here, uh, uh, most researchers agree that it should be incremental, read data only once. Very important is memory management should work anytime and deal with a uh, concept read, but not necessary. So this this is a general scheme uh, showing you know, how to design stream data mining uh, uh, system, uh, in this case for uh, classification. So here we have drip detection. It may be one of those methods uh, I explain you, know, like Komogorov Smirnov or some other statistical uh, test. Classifier, classifier, any methods uh, I'll show you in a moment. Uh, the seven trees, uh, neural networks, and many others, and uh, we should uh, uh, constantly update uh, our uh, classifier, uh, taking into account uh, input data and uh, drift uh, detection. Yeah. As I mentioned, to you there are many methods from neural network to ensemble methods. Uh, we're going to support vector machine, naive bias types, classifiers. Uh, in this area, perhaps uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of uh, papers, uh, and different approaches. Uh, one approach, and historically perhaps uh, uh, most influential in the literature, was based on decision trees. Uh, it, it's a short introduction, I will skip for decision trees because most people know what 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 is how it works. So uh, there are two aspects of the system for its design. Uh, the first is intuitive measure and the second is uh, split measure. The mathematics is very simple. It, it requires knowledge from uh, high school, uh, high school, I think uh, maybe not elementary school, I just you should know uh, uh, the you know formula for entropy. So uh, and this is the formula which is used in designing uh, decision trees uh, and uh, entropy is called impurity measure uh, in the context of decision trees and of course we know when, when we have the uh, lowest uh, possible value of this impurity measure and when we have the, the highest. Uh, another, uh, another terminology in this area is a split measure, which is a reduction of an impurity uh, uh, measure. Uh, so uh, uh, usually, I, uh, for students, I explain uh, this problem on very simple uh, um, example. We have three attributes. Uh, so <coughs> uh, uh, a person married or not, age, uh, uses computer and work. Uh, and so the three attributes are conditional attributes, and this is the decision uh, attribute. So we consider this as some notes of, you know, um, seller in uh, in a computer a computer uh, a shop. And the problem is to uh, design uh, decision decision tree. So we we uh, calculate. Uh, 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 using we, we calculate we calculate uh, using uh, entropy uh, split measure and uh, in this case uh, as you see uh, here uh, the maximum value uh, we got for uh, the uh, um, uh, 
uh, attribute uh, a person <coughs> uses computer network or not. Uh, so we start our tree uh, from from the root as you uh, see here and going and uh, going uh, down. Uh, so this is most popular technique. Uh, there are many, many, you know, uh, variations, many improvements of the basic uh, uh, decision tree uh, algorithms. Uh, uh, today I will not talk about that. Uh, in, my, in the example, I used uh, information entropy as a purity measure. Uh, we also can use Gini index or Gini classification error. And each of those, uh, each of uh, the impurity measure uh, can lead to, uh, uh, to another uh, decision, uh, to another decision tree. There are some <coughs> illustrations how it works. And there are some details how to design decision trees. Uh, that stuff was very easy, uh, you know, for not big data, not stream data. If we deal with big data, the problem is much more complicated. Typical, typical examples are here, and uh, on this slide you see uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, billions of uh, data going, going from the top, going down. We have many, many uh, sensors. In this case, we have. Uh, for example, five attributes, uh, five attributes, and we have one decision attribute. Uh, of course, it is not possible to to modify traditional decision tree algorithm for this for this uh, purpose. However, uh, several people uh, try to do that, and the problem uh, in this in this case. Uh, uh, the, the, the biggest problem is not only which attribute to choose, because in our, let's say, toy example, we choose attribute with maximum split measure, using uh, very simple uh, calculations. Uh, but the problem here is when to make a split. Uh, in this case, we have, uh, we have in this case, we have billions of, you know, going from top to down uh, data, and we should choose only some part of data, you know, trying to uh, trying uh, to design our tree, and this uh, creates a big, uh, big uh, challenge, big problem to be solved. And uh, the first people uh, who uh, try to do that. Are Domingos and Kulten in 2000 and 2001. Uh, they, uh, they created the so called heading trees and very fast decision tree and final concept adaptive very fast tree. The papers here you see on this slide they have perhaps a few thousand citations in the literature and most people, I think that almost all people, uh, Engage in uh, stream data mining, cited uh, the papers you see uh, here. Uh, uh, Domingos and Hultel, uh, for that, for to solve the problem of, uh, let's say, um, adopting traditional decision trees uh, to big data, they took, sorry, they took. Uh, the tool which is called heading inequality. That is uh, from from statistics. It says about uh, it says it says about you know probability of the derivation of mean, uh, you mean empirical mean and uh, and uh, expectation of of this mean. And this is well <coughs> this result is well known in mathematical statistics. Uh, and they took this this uh, theorem and uh, they, uh, they presented very elegant, very nice uh, result uh, showing that showing that uh, calculate split measure for attribute 
uh, would calculate split measure uh, for attribute with the highest value of, let's say, the tank attribute with the highest value of split measure. And next, take uh, attribute which gives the second, sorry, We are here. And take the attribute a max 2, which gives the second the max value of speed measure. Uh, calculate the difference and check if it is greater than epsilon, and that epsilon depends on number of data and a certain delta. And how to find formula for epsilon? <coughs> And Domingos and Houghton claim that using the having inequality, the form of epsilon is given as you see here. It mainly it, it what, what is the most important? It depends on the let's say number of data in a window we are now considering. So and this result, as I mentioned you, was cited two thousand in the literature. Uh, I never understood that result. Uh, I was familiar from 70s uh, at the time when I prepared my PhD. Uh, but I never understood at least, you know, uh, from time to time I was looking at that, but I never had time to, you know, to study, to, to go deeply how, how they achieved that result. But, I, uh, but for me it was very strange. So, uh, I think that uh, maybe nine, uh, maybe uh, nine or maybe eight years ago, uh, I got two postdocs, uh, they uh, mathematicians, and I told them that I don't understand how it, how to get from having inequality that result copied, cited to a few thousand times in the literature. Because for me it is very strange. So those people, youngster, they are sitting uh, a few days and they told me they they agree with me that it is, that it, it doesn't make sense, you know, to, to use, you know, it, they they they. So after that, uh, I sent an email to my colleague, also of Institute of Mathematics, Polytechnic Academy of Science, and a colleague was astonished, and he told me that it is nonsense. It doesn't make sense. So we, uh, we, we decided with my postdocs to work on that. And in 2014 we published the first, uh, the first uh, paper, uh, you know, uh, explaining what was wrong in the in the paper, you know, that original paper, Domingos and Hotel, and how to improve that method, how to improve. So we presented, uh, you know, a correct, correct uh, formula, formula which describes how many data we should take in order, in some statistical sense. Uh, using algorithm dedicated to big data, the result, in some probabilistic sense, would be the same as for small data. This was the, the you know, explanation of what we wanted to achieve. And we there are some other papers here in 2015, uh, and we, uh, on, you know, on some other. There is a, okay, we can summarize here with our uh, rough paper 2018. So we uh, summarized all the results uh, uh, obtained in this area uh, on this, in this table. We use different split measure, as you see here. We emphasize incorrectly obtained, you know, and we, uh, we, uh, presented several theorems showing the correct result. Again, uh, I 
uh, I recall that the epsilon in each entry of this table, epsilon is a difference between split measure uh, for attribute, uh, um, or let's say it's an attribute maximizing, maximizing split measure minus uh, attribute second attribute maximizing split, split measure. We take difference of these two quantities and check if this difference is greater than this value, especially number of data currently, you know, under observation. And this is very important because using the correct formulas, we can, with a certain probability, which is, which is related to, to this data, we can say that uh, our result, in a probabilistic sense, dealing, you know, dealing with big data, uh, is uh, equivalent to the result dealing with uh, small data, roughly speaking. Uh, I will look at, perhaps I don't have more time. Serious. Ten minutes? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Uh, We did a lot of work with 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 with, with our uh, algorithms. Uh, when we also constructed hybrid criterion. What is the hybrid criterion? We use different speed measures uh, like misclassification error and Gini. They are different. And we at a certain stage of three generation, uh, we uh, we use. Uh, uh, as you see uh, here, uh, misclassification error uh, as a split measure and later on uh, a Gini index. And uh, uh, empirically, we show that such combination uh, gives very good results. And this was published in Hyperbolic Transactions on Neural Network 2018. There are some, some other, some other results which I skip here. Uh, another area of our research is uh, possible use of ensemble methods. Uh, all, uh, concerning ensemble methods for steam data mining, uh, there are a lot of very, uh, very challenging uh, questions, problems to be, to be solved. Uh, for those for you, uh, I'm sure that most of you uh, are familiar with ensemble methods. It's like there are many classifiers, like like many like a team of doctors. So we consult in a certain number of doctors, and we combine the you know uh, the diagnosis, and we should uh, properly combine the diagnosis, and finally we have the system. So this is the you know if if, if, if somebody is not familiar, that is the main idea of ensemble uh, methods. So. <laughs> there are many problems concerning uh, designing such such uh, uh, such uh, structure. Uh, which components to use? Uh, how big the ensemble should be? How to train the components? Each of these uh, each of these questions can be you know a subject of of PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, our uh, our original result. Uh, was uh, our original result in this area. Uh, please look at this uh, at this uh, uh, blood diagram. Uh, you see uh, a certain number of classifiers, and we uh, we want to we want to check. Uh, Doesn't make sense to add additional classifier and it will you know improve the performance of the entire structure so on the second you know you see here we add here we add one more so if we add one more then we have another accuracy so we have this accuracy uh, before we had this accuracy uh, and the question is, does it make sense 
to add new classifier, it will be better or not. And uh, what, we want to, what, what, what we wanted to achieve, we wanted to analytically, uh, analytically prove that adding a new member of a team uh, possibly would improve the uh, performance of the entire structure. Uh, so our main result uh, was published, uh, I think that year ago, I'm not sure, 2017 or 2018, I'm not sure. Uh, so just calculate probabilities, which is very, you know, the formulas are elementary formulas <coughs> for calculation of probabilities, and check if the difference. So that, that is probability performance of that uh, uh, um, structure uh, which which contains one more uh, one more block, uh, one more uh, component, and this uh, and this is uh, this is uh, uh, before adding that one more component, and we check if that difference is greater than this quantity. And this is the number of observations in our current window. And this is the quantile of the standard normal distribution. So if it is satisfied, then that we can expect the improvements uh, of and it makes sense, it, it makes sense uh, to add a new component. When to remove a component from the ensemble in a similar way. In a similar way, we uh, we check. Uh, probabilities, uh, calculate differences. If it is satisfied, then uh, uh, then uh, the removal of the classifier will decrease the accuracy of the ensemble, and that you know theoretical investigations were supported by by many experiments. Uh, and the last thing uh, I will mention only to maybe two minutes. I guess I don't have more time, so maybe one minute. Probabilistic neural networks for extreme data mining. Uh, most, uh, I think that all of us are familiar, you know, with histograms and and uh, probability uh, uh, density. So uh, histograms uh, for many many years. Uh, uh, so it's a popular uh, popular tool, you know, to um, visualize. Uh, Mm, uh, random, uh, random data. However, in the 50s and later in the 60s, uh, Emmanuel Parton and Kapoulos, they discovered another method for uh, representation of uh, uh, probabilistic data. They uh, proposed uh, uh, mm, pro they proposed density estimators. Density estimators it was proposed by Kapoulos. We take several data. We K is a like Gaussian kernel, for instance, and based on you know using that formula, we we we, we get estimator of, of of true unknown probability densities. And what we what we did we work on uh, the problem when that unknown probability densities is changing with time, and this creates a big problem because you see here now the data from x1 to xn you know they have different probability densities so we have to track for changing probability densities we propose this algorithm and similarly we propose the algorithm for the you know time learning regression function using the same parts and methods. However, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the theoretical part uh, was, uh, was uh, built by us uh, from the start. I mean, it was not possible to use directly, uh, uh, you know, parts and uh, parts <coughs> uh, uh, proposition. Uh, and there are some illustrations from, from, our, uh, from our book. Uh, Summarizing, uh, 
Uh, we already use slim beta mining algorithm uh, we propose a split measure uh, and the challenge is to find optimal value of constant C in this formula because most most you know differences between you know uh, for a uh, split measure for attribute which maximizes and the second which maximizes is in this in, in this uh, in, in this spirit. We don't claim that our result is optimal on the best in the world. However, so far, uh, you know, people perhaps are still working on that, uh, and it is very active, uh, very active area of uh, research. Uh, going, you know, to, to the end, there are some, several references you may find in our uh, book. Uh, each year, uh, we uh, organize a conference. Uh, uh, on artificial intelligence and soft computing in Zakopane, Professor Alan Alanda visited us and had a uh, plenary lecture a few uh, years ago. Uh, so, uh, the conference uh, has not bad reputation. Please consider <laughs> to come uh, to Zakopane uh, next, uh, next uh, year. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, entire lecture. And, uh, now, do we have questions? No, Not at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to this conference, and I feel really honored. And I would like to talk a little bit about uh, feature selection and extend this notion to the multidimensional level. So for the last year, I've been working on uh, implementation and accelerating of the multidimensional feature selection algorithm and uh, developing its implementation uh, on the distributed environments. All this to provide scientists with a new tool uh, that will allow to analyze data that, cons uh, that uh, contains variables that are relevant only when considered in groups and are not relevant when considered alone. So, a little bit about context. So, in the 21st century, we've been introduced with the new and the fourth scientific discovery paradigm that is based on data. Uh, growth of computing capabilities in connection with big data manipulation and the analysis uh, give us new tools for broadening the knowledge and bringing new scientific breakthroughs. Let's take a brief view on the scientific landscape that reveals itself in front of us today. Here are some interesting uh, scientific projects that are under development today and will be operational in the near future. In the left picture, we can see Large Hadron Collider that is located at CERN. Although it is operational since 2009, it is now undergoing a substantial upgrade to the high luminosity LHC that will increase its luminosity uh, by a factor of 10 beyond the original LHC uh, design value. It is expected to be optional since 2026 and is expected to generate 30 times more data than the LHC has uh, already produced. The amount of data that LHC has already produced is close to an exabyte. Therefore, we will need close to uh, 30 exabytes of storage in coming years only to support this project. In the middle picture, we can see a large synoptic serving telescope that is located in north central Chile and is expected to be optional since 2022. In this astronomical project, we will conduct a 10-year survey of the sky and will deliver uh, 500 petabytes, half an exabyte, of images and other data products that address uh, questions about structure and evolution of the universe. And in the right picture, we can see square parameter array uh, radio telescope in short SCA uh, that is located in Australia, in Australia is expected to be our chance since 2027. 
uh, these thousands of radio receivers will create eventually a square kilometer of collecting area and uh, combined will create the world's largest radio telescope. And this project is expected to generate over half an exabyte of data per year. Uh, so it is clear that uh, problems to be solved require approaches that are far beyond simply scaling current solutions. And it was nicely put it, uh, in the roadmap for high energy physics software at computing RD for the 2020s that the nature of computing hardware is evolving with radically new paradigms. The quantity of data to be processed is increasing dramatically, its complexity is increasing, and more sophisticated analysis will be required to maximize physics yield. Uh, having talked a little bit about physics, let's move to the original motivation of this work that is inside us. The genomics is a field of great complexity where genes and proteins can interact with each other directly or indirectly. Some genes can be expressed strongly, while others can remain inactive. Additionally, human genome consists, uh, includes 100 trillion bacterial cells that affect our health, immunity, and comfort. Uh, but above all, genomics and omics in general is a field of great promises such as precision medicine that will allow uh, prediction of genetic diseases and uh, will cure plenty type of cancer or allow to produce drugs that are dedicated to the specific patient and his specific condition. So it is clear that the data is a good source for knowledge development and for broadening, uh, um, for expanding the comprehension of the universe. And what we are experiencing today is a flood of data and we need to find relevant information in it. Uh, and every data analysis begins with data introspection and evaluation. Uh, finding information, the, the variables and features that are relevant for the phenomena, phenomena under scrutiny is inseparable part of every knowledge development. And uh, additionally, reduction of problem dimensionality can lead to storage savings and allow faster data manipulation in next steps of the analysis. What's more, the data can contain variables that are only relevant when considered in groups and are not relevant when considered alone, which is complicating the case faster. And uh, these facts are not negligible, but, uh, uh, but analysis of new phenomena where the domain-specific knowledge is limited or missing is hard and feature selection and feature engineering is even harder. In such cases, it is highly likely that some additional irrelevant information will be stored or some relevant information will be disposed. Uh, there are many methods dedicated to feature selection and they fall into three main categories. First, filters, where the identification of informative variables is performed before data modeling and analysis, and the examples are regularization and multidimensional feature selection, which is the subject of this presentation. Wrappers, where the identification of informative variables is achieved by analysis of the models, and the examples are random forest and support vector machines, and embedded methods, which evaluate utility of variables in the model and select the most useful variables. An example are deep neural networks and principal component analysis. So, uh, now we know that multidimensional feature selection belongs to the filters category, and it is uh, this algorithm proposed by Nichen Rudnitsky in a paper All Relevant Feature Selection Using Multidimensional Features with Exhaustive Search. Uh, so what exactly is MDFS? And to understand it, we need to know basics of information theory and this uh, 
and these notions and definitions, such as information entropy, that is the measure of the information stored in the information system, information gain, that is the measure of how much the decision variable y is dependent on, uh, on variable xi, and the multidimensional information gain, that is the extension of information gain to the multidimensional space, where by uh, computing the difference between uh, conditional information entropies of subsets with Xi and without Xi, we are able to uh, we are able to measure the k weak relevance of that information Xi. Uh, and this difference of conditional information entropies is known as conditional mutual information and is expressed as IGK in this talk. So to perform multidimensional feature selection, we need to generate all k element subsets of variables and then compute multidimensional information gain in the, in the relation to the variable xi. Then we are able to find the ma maximum multidimensional information gain that reflects the biggest mutual information of that variable xi. And uh, the simplest uh, analysis is the one-dimensional one and is expressed by this formula. Uh, so a little bit about complexity. So we need to generate all k element subsets of variables. Therefore the size of the problem is expressed by binomial coefficient of number of variables and number of dimensions. Therefore, the size of the problem grows rapidly with the number of variables and the number of dimensions and, uh, and, and can achieve uh, impressive numbers uh, quickly. And for example, if you were to perform analysis of 500 variables or 340,000 variables in one or two or three dimensions, we can achieve quite impressive numbers of revenue. <coughs> and these characteristics of multidimensional feature selection leads to the requirement for a vast computations that cannot be performed on the typical desktop or personal computer, and we need to turn to, for help to high performance computing and benefit from these beautiful machines. Uh, most of HPC clusters consist of hundreds or thousands of nodes uh, that are connected via dedicated, sorry, dedicated interconnect. Each, each computing node is equipped with a CPU, central processing unit, with local memory and increasingly a dedicated computing element called accelerator like FPGA or GPU. So uh, uh, these beautiful machines require dedicated software and development of this uh, software uh, needs uh, special libraries. An example of such library is High Performance Parallels. Uh, HPX is a uh, is a C++ library that is an implementation of theoretical execution model parallels. And uh, what does it do? So we have hundreds or thousands of computing nodes and we have our problem that consists of hundreds or thousands of tasks and threads and we need to map this problem efficiently on the machine to utilize the hardware efficiently and to achieve the solutions in a reasonable time. And HPX introduces several new approaches to the parallelism, but uh, here are uh, displaced four key ones, such as active global address space, constraint based synchronization, lightweight threads, and data directed execution. So, having that, 
we prepared two implementations of multidimensional feature selection algorithm. First one, that, in, that is pros, optimal from computation perspective, but introduces more data dependencies and therefore requires more synchronization. And second implementation that uh, introduces redundant computation, but the parallel is more straightforward and therefore we, we need less synchronization. So a little bit about first implementation. So we need to generate all k element uh, subsets of the variables, and for each of the subsets, we need to uh, compute contingency table uh, and then reduce contingency table in relation to the xi. And after that, we are able to compute information gain of that variable xi and store it in the vector of maximum ig's. This is the maximum ig. So a little bit about subset generation. So, for example, we have 10 variables that <coughs> perform three dimensional analysis. So, let's pick up x5 as an example. So, we begin from x5, x6, x7, and increment the variables accordingly till x5, x9, x10. Uh, and x5 remains constant. And uh, what is interesting, if we, for example, pick up x2 as our starting point, we have this sequence, again we are starting from x2, x3, x4 and we are implementing the variables accordingly and what is the problem here is that these sequences can vary much and uh, therefore the load balancing of our work is not straightforward and, uh, and we came up with this uh, distribution scheme that we call uh, up and down distribution scheme uh, so again, we have 10 variables and we want to distribute work among uh, three workers and uh, so the, we are first going up, so x1 is going to the first worker, second one is going to the second one, third one is going to the third one and again fourth is going to the third one and we are now going down x5 is to the second and x5 is to the first and this is the assignment we would achieve in this example. A little bit about second implementation. So in this case, we are generating k minus one element subsets, and we are somehow attaching the xi that we are interested of, and therefore we can compute the contingency table, the reduced contingency table, and in result the information gain of that variable xi, and again store it in a vector. So a little bit about generation scheme. So again, we have ten variables. We want and we are just then let's pick up x5 as a starting point. So we are starting from x5, x1, x2, and we are implementing the variables accordingly. X5 remains constant, and this is the sequence we would achieve. And as you can see, this sequence is much bigger than the one presented uh, in the first implementation but interesting uh, uh, interesting point is that if we pick up x2 as our starting point to achieve the same sizes of the sequences therefore distribution of work is more straightforward uh, and uh, in this in this example this is the this is the assignment we would achieve and if there was x11, for example, it would go to the third worker. A little bit about the results. So we did perform our test on CrayXC40 Okeanos that is located at our facility. It has around 1,000 computing nodes. And each node uh, is equipped with two CPUs. And each CPU is Intel Xeon with 12 cores way hardware threading and 2.6 GHz clock frequency and the interconnect is Great Irish Network with Dragonfly topology and we did perform our analysis on two datasets first one the Madelon that has 2000 objects and 500 variables and second one the Neuroblastoma 
that has three, 340,000 variables. Please note that uh, it has uh, three orders of magnitude more uh, variables than the first one. And it has uh, 500 objects, which are versions in this case. And here are the results of the uh, strong scaling results uh, from one node up to 556 nodes. So, uh, as you can see, both, uh, both uh, implementations per, uh, are scaling well, but the first one, here are three lines, of, uh, is performing better. Uh, it is scaling well and it has slower time of the analysis because it is optimal from the computation perspective. Uh, and here you can see a starvation because there was not enough work uh, for each node, therefore it, it didn't scale well in this example. A little bit about speed up, so we can achieve close to a linear speed up in relation to nodes, uh, up to 556 nodes, and again first implementation is performing <coughs> better. Uh, we did perform a weak scaling test and uh, we call it a, a big data scenario and as big data scenario we uh, we understood the situation where the data cannot fit uh, whole data cannot fit on the single node therefore it has to be processed in chunks and uh, it was processed that way in this example and in this case we're in, uh, incrementing the size of the problem uh, along with the number of nodes and we are able to uh, to maintain a constant processing time of our analysis and here about the performance growth so as you can see when we increment the number of nodes we can achieve close to a uh, uh, in our, uh, we can achieve in our uh, performance graph. And here is neuroblastoma, uh, uh, results for the rest of neuroblastoma, and again we are achieving good, uh, strong scaling results uh, independently of the, of the data set uh, it is performed on. And as you can see, uh, even though it has three orders of magnitude more variables, we are able to perform the analysis. And future work, so we are looking for further optimization possibilities of presented implementations, and this includes the current implementations and, uh, and looking for other approaches. Uh, we want to expand our tool with new features, such as detection of subsets that implicates information gain for each variable, because this is important for the scientists to know, for example, exactly which genes uh, interact with others. Uh, maybe building dependency graph, and it would be something like a knowledge network that will uh, show how variables are connected and which are strongly connected, which are less. And uh, we are exploring GPU computations possibilities, and um, we, what I mean is we are looking for uh, distributed GPU computations. In conclusion, so we did uh, prepare two implementations from MDFS, MDFS method. First implementation performs better and is able to scale up from 1 to 556 nodes, which is above 6000 CPUs, uh, CPU cores, and these are CPU only computations, you don't require any other accelerators. Uh, and we did achieve reduction of analysis time from 6.5 hours below 3 minutes so you can increase your performance from one analysis per day up to 30, uh, 20 analysis per hour and we, uh, we showed perfectly scaling results when we can maintain the constant processing time from 1 to 64 gigabytes and I'd like to thank all people that uh, helped me with this work uh, they showed me good heart and their patience, and especially uh, Maciej Markiany, uh, Radosław Kiliszek, uh, Marek Michalewicz, that is present in the audience, 
and uh, we talk to you. See? Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. Ma. I'm curious uh, because the uh, heuristic is you know, very simple, like the heuristic I showed before. Uh, based, based on the drop of the Yes. Uh, so I'm curious. Uh, uh, are there any available commercial available packages for solving similar problems? And did you make some comparisons? Uh, my work was uh, dedicated to accelerating this algorithm. And Vito Trunis is the author, and he done all the testing and so on. And I'm not a statistician, I'm a mathematician. Uh, so I, I don't know um, about any com com very good uh, results with, uh, with this method. Okay, I understand that you got your, 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 your achieved you know, a goal by speeding up. You know? Yes. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to talk today about how we can automate gathering the data about processes which are quite often described by the plain language, which is not always easy. And then also, this gives us a very interesting viewpoint on do we need experts or is the AI absolutely enough? And then some of these show, uh, shed some light on this problem. The work was done in the Center of Network Science and Technology at RPI and uh, Dr. Xiang Niu just joined the Google research team and Professor George Cornish is my colleague from physics. And in the general in the work is really presented in this much, much larger group involved. So what is the problem? And we got intrigued participating in World Economic Forums in the yearly global risk report, which is a titanic work. They engage about 1,000 experts all over the world, which they provide the assessment of about 30 to 50 risks which they deem to be the most important <coughs> in the year. And they estimate for each risk on one axis, this is the y-axis impact, and on the other axis, likelihood it is measure of intuitive measure, not probability. Likelihood of this event happening. And they group them into very broad groups. So economic, they are now economic uh, uh, risks, which are uh, blue or dark blue. And as you see, they are spread over. For example, we have, of oh, this color change. Here we have some unemployment, which is like pretty high, both in terms of the impact and in terms of probability. And then, you know, we have also a smaller one, like failure of critical infrastructure, which would be much smaller. And then we can go with environmental, which are green. And it happens to be that in 2016, this issue started to become very important, because if you use if you uh, look at this, extreme weather events are very highly likely and also very impactful and that is the result of the climate change. 
when not only there's the, the warming, but the extremes of the weather becomes larger, it's less stable. And of course we have also some events which would be much lower around. And if we go further, we have also geopolitical, and geopolitical are important because, for example, you see that we have this very likely event coming, which is large-scale migration, and uh, also we have some smaller in this area, like, uh, for example, it could be uh, global governments, failure of global governments, which is what it means that, for example, the security, the security Committee of the United Nations have the vote, have the votes which allow some big powers to block uh, punishment for the breakers of the of the of the, of the uh, agreement between countries. And then the other thing is societal, and in this societal again you can see a spread of these different risks. What is very interesting if you look at this risk. Some of them are very, very mathematically oriented. We have, for example, good sense when environmental, like hurricanes, monsoons come, we can have a good sense of distribution and so forth and so forth. The others are extremely descriptive, societal, how we measure. At what point migration becomes a big threat and at what point it does not. At what point migration is active and at what point is helpful. So clearly we need new tools in order to describe dynamics of the system. And that was our goal. Technologically are uh, quite measurable, better than social, societal and geopolitical, economic are also measurable because they are easily expressed in money. So one of the most important things that we need to discover in order to do any models we need to discover how dynamics looks in the past. Because we can set some parameters, very typical approach, for this model, and then match this model with the past data in order to do prediction. So that's the way we proceed here. So therefore, the fairly important idea is that experts don't provide very strong backing why they choose these values which they choose. And therefore, they choose it, of course, knowing, in a general, assessing on their knowledge and contacts, what it is. But we would like to back it up with the, with the publications and media. We want to learn from the web media which is active and when, because it's instrumental to the model to map it. But then there is also a very subtle thing. Media are not the same as expert assessment. What is the difference? And then that would tell us whether using just the data we would expect would be as precise. And finally, we are interested in regional uh, uh, effects of this, because for free, when we process this data, we can get places in which this risk activate. Going then, what model we use? Model is well known, it's machinery theory. We have this model in which machine is working okay in state normal, and then, of course, failure causes that machine does not produce anything. If we apply it to risk, it's very similar, except that we also introduce some maybe additional states, in this case, that would be state of recovery. But basically, then, what is important, unlike machine, that in this risk, we have three different dynamics, and it could be very nicely expressed in the equation describing the dynamic of the whole system. There is an internal process. Each of these risks can fail on its own based under the weight of the event. On the other hand, there is the connected, connected pots. In other words, if we have a situation that one risk overwhelms the forces of the civilization, uh, industry, government, then that may impact ability to extend the pressure from other risks. So therefore, we have also external process. In this external process, we have cause that one risk being active activates the other. And then the recovery process is telling us how likely is this risk to continue to be active. And please note, LL in these equations means likelihood assessed by the <coughs> experts. 
And then we allow that the experts may distort the probabilities. So therefore, we have these very important parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, which we would like to find from the past performance, which will tell us how precise experts were in assessing the risks. And then that leads to this maximum likelihood evaluation problem, where we have a Markovian process in which each of these risks in each time tick, time tick was chosen as one month, which sort of experimental was the best, week was too small and quarter was too long. And then we would then get the equation which would tell us that in one month all the states of the all risks may change according to these equations, which tell us if the if the state of this risk was whatever it is, then the change may come through these three processes which are uh, assumed to be Poisson. So therefore, we can take the log of this and then try to match the data with these probabilities and see what is the discrepancy and find out the most likely values of alpha, beta, gamma which gave us the values. <coughs> but for that, we need the data. We need the data when it was active at the, in the past in order to do this. So we turn to Wikipedia current event portal, WCP, which describes events in this way that we can extract them to, the, uh, to our list. Because experts, when they describe each risk, they use the keywords to describe what kind of events would belong to this risk. And therefore, using these keywords and iteratively in supervised learning, drawing more keywords from the data, we can get the process going. So, for example, in this uh, Wikipedia uh, data, we have stories. Like, for example, a 2004 Atlantic hurricane season. And for each story, we have set of events associated with this story. For example, event 4571 reports that at least nine deaths were in Florida, two deaths in Bahamas, and one death in Georgia, which were blamed on the storm. Damage estimates range widely from 2 billion to 15 billion reported on the September 7, 2004. So when we see that this event, in fact, refers to storm, death by, we death by weather, and economic loss by weather. And those are all the keywords which are associated with survey risks. And they also identify places, Florida, Bahama, Georgia, and the day. So how we process it? So we build a system in which we have these initial keywords given by experts, and for each for each risk according to the description, we find these initiated keywords, and then we have this extreme weather event, and we have this initial list of keywords, and then like for example storm, and then keyword storm. So therefore, we would then go through all the list of stories, and then we would see whether the story contains the tag and then we would then compare it to the list of keywords and if we see that repeatedly several words uh, repeat in these stories associated with this, we will see whether there are reasonable keywords for this event. So we merge keywords lists and like for example storm, for example here storm didn't happen so we not, do not have new uh, keywords will be storm again but of course we could have death by storm and therefore would be added. And then what we have is step three, we take event and keyword and filter by event, uh, event by keywords and see whether or not we have the tag corresponding to this. So that enables us to get each event positive or negative instance in respect to the given, to the given risk. Example, if we have class storms, positive instances would have to contain the word storm. Tropical storm, gas storm, and so forth. This event has positive relation. Negative instances, abstract quantum surveys had some problems. Nothing to do with storms. So therefore, we can classify according to this 
all these events automatically. And then in the step four, we create better board representation and using random forest classification, we select the relevant, we select the relevant words. So trains, classifiers using back of word representation of the description. That's the step number four. For example, we, once we have positive instances, storm, we see that it's tropical storm, rain, flooding, and so forth, and we check how often they repeat and then even add them or not to the new one. Negative instances, airways, plane, drop, worldwide and so forth would be also would be also a dead edit. And in step five, now we have the final stages, random forest classification, we entropy run of the feature keywords and then select keywords by human decision, this is why it's supervised. So rise features keyword of the training classified by the entropy and then we have storm, we see that the highest was storm, next was rain, third was flooding, and so forth. That, as the result, we could add, for example, top two uh, words, which are not yet in the keyword list, rain and flooding, to this addition. So therefore, the whole diagram is shown over here, and I went through step to step. It looks complicated, but in fact, it's a very straightforward implementation of this building uh, iteratively word uh, back of words a representation of this starting as an initiation what we got from our experts and then using that we would be able reliably to get uh, events corresponding to each risk what is very important in the large databases like this in wikipedia 90 percent of events are not related to global risk. So therefore, we only focus on 10% of these events and that we avoid uh, processing all the events. So 90% of the work is safe for humans, only 10% will be left for processing and checking. Here is an example how we build through that risk, risk uh, uh, network. We have this story about Atlantic hurricane season, and then we had event uh, 4571, which was related to this of extreme weather event, then, and failure of climate change. They are connected. So, therefore, now we see that we are called triggered. And then, in the next event, we may have another risk, large, uh, large scale in the involuntary migration should not be connected because it's not related to them at this point but later we can find connections but they are connected because quite often the weather change impacts that people feel that they cannot live in their countries and try to escape the bad weather and bad crops so as the result we now here have a comparison of two networks <coughs> one was built by experts it's on the top, World Economic Forum. The other was built by going to media and seeing what media tell about the same events. And they are very close, as you see. Look at the colors and so forth. Where size of the size of the nodes show how intensive they were <coughs> in terms of likelihood in experts, in experts network, which is the higher one. And in media, also look at connectivity similar but not exactly the same. For example, we have only 170 edges in the uh, World Economic Forum, but 201 edges in the uh, uh, media network. And only 108 common edges. So what we found out from these experiments, that humans look at things which are very visible to them, very strongly affecting their life. For example, assets bubble. Of course, it be inflation, uh, problems with the banking, slowing the economy, extreme weather, uh, weather events. Of course, they are floods, uh, suffering, and so forth. And then private data. Yes, it affects our lives. On the other hand, so, well, the risk directly impacted the data. On the other hand, 
by the way, by the university laws. That's much more difficult for common people to worry about it immediately. They still see animals, they still see you know, nature around. But scientists are alerted, experts are alerted, because they see all these small uh, knots visible for every day, uh, genes, uh, I mean, uh, species dying, and that's a very dangerous thing. And the other thing, risk with future potential impact on humanity are much more stressed in the expert system. So that means that we need experts, because they provide this bigger knowledge which goes beyond just the shared data in the media. So, for example, if you get once again need to see that we now can also get location of these events. So not on the dates, and that really provides <coughs> us with the interesting view of the, of the map, because all of a sudden we see concentrations. For example, Atlantic hurricane season, extreme weather event happened in Virginia, United States. Then one event comes. Then we have also the story about Florida and Georgia, again United States, two events. Then we see Cuba being uh, impacted by the large-scale involuntary migration. Cuba would, would get societal risk, one event count. And then if you look, for example, that way counting, and then normalizing by taking the count plus one and divided by max count plus one, we get where is the highest level of events. For example, the economy, it was Russia and US, which were 1, 0, 95. Next was Japan, 75, Mexico, 72, and Greece, 61. So the most developed countries and the countries on the verge, which sort of uh, then are most affected. If we look at the map of environmental, you would notice that uh, mostly the countries with large coasts because coasts are the really frontier of the weather. Storm can come from the you know, oceans and seas and affect human's life. On the other hand, if, for example, US was 5.0, Mexico 0.9, China 0.97, Japan 0.91, India 0.91. Geopolitical, as you see, it's North Korea and Syria and a lot of countries around the Middle East. Again, those are the countries in which there is a staging war or unstable political situation, <coughs> and therefore, not surprisingly, they are most affected. And then the heat map of societal is very similar to the previous one because all these geopolitical traumas translate into pressure on society, and which leads to oppression and so forth. Finally, technological, it's very interesting. US, you, you, you see US, UK, China, therefore they are countries which are the most developed or most moving forward when this pressure is being created. So that was very useful. We for free got this kind of efficient views how these views are concentrated on the, on the map of the world. So we saw that as an advantage. So contribution of our role, we did an automatic detection tool for this event collection. We reconstructed relational dependencies from risk events in the Wikipedia uh, crowd source uh, events. And then we show that experts are concerned about long-term risk, which may not even actually create activation. But if they come, they would be very dangerous. So therefore, we look more into the future, whereas the public and media tend to concentrate on actual risks, which are making our life difficult. We've also found that spatial characteristics arise when we gather the information and just map them. So this visualization of data showing additional information where they are located clearly show on the map of the world certain concentration points, things with which things are tense. And then economic risks are in trade, developed countries, and also providers of uh, resources. Environmental risks are in coastal areas, geopolitical risks are in stable nations, social risks are consequence of geopolitical risks, and technological risks are in technological advanced countries. 
So that was the contribution, and I'll be happy to answer the question, not to stand between you and the drinks. Yes, please. Uh, I have a kind of a humorous uh, a side, side comment, uh, which is the following. I've lived in North Carolina and in Florida. Both areas know yes. be hit by hurricanes and so on. Now, uh, a hurricane is bad news for the insurance company. Yes. Uh, but it's not bad news for the state as a whole because it pushes up the GDP of the state uh, simply because uh, the construction companies have a lot of work. So the construction industry loves hurricanes. Yes. And furthermore, the school children like it because the, clo the schools are closed. Schools are used as places where people can go and stay uh, when there is something like that. And the kids just love it because they don't get any capital in school. So there are positives and negatives. Yes, how you look at it. Yes, I just wanted to mention this yeah. comment. It's a very good comment. And also, please note that it also shows a hidden connection. Because, for example, in the US, insurance, especially in these uh, areas on the coast, are subsidized strongly by the government. And therefore, rich people build these wonderful houses, you know, they are washed every five or ten years, and they get a new house because insurance pays for them. And the insurance doesn't, doesn't represent the cost to society. So therefore, those are very interesting dilemma. What we do about them? We should change the policy, especially when the weather change. Now, 100 years last happened every 10 years. 100 year hurricanes now come every 10 years. That changes the outcome for the insurance company. And I, on the other hand, I can also uh, say a very similar story. Somebody claims, few economists, that Titanic created a boom for American industry. So many old stubborn, you know, captains of the, of the American companies died in Titanic and their sons took over and they were open to no innovation. So, and then if you look, it's a bump. It's a bump jumping up the night. The, the, the 1911 the Titanic sank in terms of the productivity and innovation in the US. So you never know. The same story in Renaissance. Renaissance was caused by disaster in the, you know, the epidemics in Europe. All of a the sudden, there was not enough people. It was the fault of the Turks. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. That's true. So you see, disasters sometimes are beneficial, long term, but it's very difficult to explain to the people who suffer. It's always the fault of the first. <laughs> yes. sources from young researchers, brilliant researchers, to all captains of the industry who know everything, to politicians who maneuver. So I think it's a very, well, I wanted to tell you, error in their predictions of probabilities was 4%. Amazing. When you publish the results, all this I told you how we did it. Participation, in, unless you are invited, Cost fifty thousand dollars, and every expert who does the expertise has the right to come. Not everybody comes. Only two, two and a half thousand people from all the world come. <coughs> mixture of talents, mixture of scientists, artists, everything, and of course, a lot of politics. Thank you. 
Thank you again. Thank you.